Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank the Rootbelt Academy, uh, the Celic Museum, and of course Warren for the invitation, as well as you as the audience. Uh, as Warren mentioned, I work as a curator, but my initial education was a clinical psychologist with a specialization in psychoanalysis. As a result, a line of my research revolves around subjectivation and, neo and neoliberal politics. Also, it's important to mention that I was born and I am currently based in Lima, Peru. This fact will appear throughout my presentation in different ways. The talk that I'm going to present today is called um, Notes on Well-Being and Effective Resistance in Times on Cognitive Capitalism, and is divided uh, more or less in three chapters. Uh, it results from an investigation that I started last year in the context of a residency in Barcelona, that then took form of a paper for a symposium and a book in Colombia, and that now I am presenting here in this talk. Uh, I will basically read the paper, but I want to propose the following dynamic. I will start showing a single image of an artwork or an artistic practice that has tri triggered or generated the ideas related to these dif to this, this, to this three different chapters of the talk. Hopefully, uh, later on during the Q&A or probably during the round table, we'll have time to uh, discuss discuss uh, more, in a more detailed way uh, the images. So the first chapter is called The Well-Being Industry in Cognitive Capitalism. I will start reading, so please stay with me. Uh, undoubtedly, we are living in a period in which an economic logic dominates the social imaginary at every level. The common sense is not only that there is no viable alternative to capitalism, but that everything in society must be managed as a business. In this context of a mercantilistic global imaginary, the notion of well-being has emerged as a category of political and economical analysis to later become a powerful industry oriented to the mass production of an over-adapted subjectivity. In his article, The Economy, Poli the Economy, of, Pol the Economy of Unhappiness, British sociologist William Davies argues that the commodification of the notion of well-being is a relatively new phenomenon that results from the intangible nature of labor in Western post-industrial capitalism, or in other words, of cognitive capitalism. Davis' thesis is that since work has become more immaterial, psychological diseases have turned out to be the most or the most common form of disability, and therefore a direct threat to economy. As a result, in recent years, the mind and its discontents are being subjected to an unprecedented scrutiny. Certainly, according to Davis, the notion of well-being has provided the political paradigm by which the mind can be described as an economic resource. Using the metaphor of human capital, cognitive capitalism deals with psychological reality in an analogous way to physical capital, exposing it to the diverse forms of efficiency and productivity analysis. While many might contravene Davis' thesis by arguing that mental suffering is the pathology of a privileged virtual class and that cognitive capitalism represents only a small share of the employment in global terms, we cannot deny that gradually it's becoming the hegemonic form of labor. Indeed, after having subjected the totally, terri the totally planetary territory, capitalism seems have to reach a turning point redirecting all its energy to conquer the inner world, the subjectivity, or the space of the mind. Thus, in the era of the digital technology, capitalism has overcome the dualism of the body and the mind, establishing a workforce in which creativity and feelings are mobilized for its own benefit. That is, it has managed to hijack libidinal forces or desire to the point that outside work, nothing seems to capture us. Today, exploitation involves the mind, language, and emotions. As Franco Berardi Bifo says, it is precisely because of the absorption of the libertarian creativity and the desire of self-realization that capital has managed to reinvent itself after the crisis of the 70s and the 60s and the 70s uh, and find a new ideological foundation. However, these political or economical systems exposes us to a series of deep contradictions. 
while the requirement of enthusiasm and energy at work increases, neoliberal policies destroy all the security and social support, establishing an atmosphere of insecurity and competition. As the Italian feminist Silvia Ferici reminds us, the struggles of the 60s and 70s not only led to cognitive capitalism, but simultaneously showed the capitalist class that investment in the reproduction of labor force did not necessarily imply a higher productivity. Since then, the social democratic model of redistribution and equilibrium was or, or has been started to be dismantled, and, it's met, and investment in public services such as health, education, transport, among others, have been drastically reduced to later become private services for which citizens must pay. The absence of welfare policies and a compulsive mandate to succeed as the only imaginable resource of satisfaction has configured as a structure of feeling of the epoch a state of omnipotence or collective mania in which positive feelings are promoted as the only one desirable states, while an important set of human emotions like sadness, shame, anger, among others, are made invisible or even, or even socially punished. As a corollary, not only the contemporary psychological discourses are increasingly focused in generating productive and overadapted subjectivities, but it was, but it was, what, sorry, but what is most alarming is that the development of the pharmaceutical industry is following this same idea. Alan Frances, in his book *Saving the Normal*, Alan Frances, Frances is the director of the working group of the American Psychiatric Association and he was responsible for the creation of the fourth edition of the Diagnostic Manual of Mental Disorders, which is this kind of Bible for psych psychiatrists, affirms that recent, recently a dangerous turn has taken place in psychiatry. As a consequence, normal emotions can quickly be labeled as a product of mood, mood regu deregulations and treated with powerful and unnecessary drugs. Underlying this turn, it's possible to find the inflation of a long-standing thesis in the, in the psychiatric world, the chemical imbalance theory. The chemical imbalance theory understands mental disorders as a result of potentially identifiable deviations from normal biological functioning of the brain. However, the truth is that while previously the chemical imbalance theory was applied to a relatively small group of people with serious mental disorders, in recent years, and thanks to the activities of the pharmaceutical industry, it has spread to a large part of the society. In this way, awareness campaigns on mental illness for depression, anxiety, stress, attention deficit disorder, among many others, have uh, founded by the pharmaceutical companies create the impression that the biochemical basis of psychiatric disorders is well established when, it really, when, when it's really not so sophisticated. <laughs> significantly increasing the number of people who define themselves as suffering from mental disorders and decide to use medication. In capitalist realism, is there no alternative? Mark Fisher stated that blaming the brain of mental illness is strictly, strictly proportional to its depolitization. For the author, understanding mental illness as an individual problem has enormous benefits for capitalism. First, it reinforces the optimistic individualization, making subjects incapable of taking any collective action. And second, it provides a highly lucrative market for multinational pharmaceuticals companies. Then, if people are permanently preoccupied by their mental health, they will be less able to challenge the social conditions and fight for alternative values. Therefore, the application of the theory of chemical imbalance not only helps to expand the mar markets for psychotropic drugs, but also creates the condi conditions in which neoliberal policies can flourish without resistance. Even worse, this is also leading to the mass fabrication of a domesticated and hyperflexible subjectivity ready to be self-exploited in order to participate of the delirium of omnipotence that capitalism proposes. However, if we admit that currently the mind is the primary site of control, and now that psychological diseases have reached an epidemic level, couldn't it also function as a place of political resistance? And if that is the case, from which 
uh, frameworks can we think or imagine ways to reverse the colonization and exploitation of our minds and feelings by co corporate interests? Well, having sell, said all this or having in some way um, explained the panorama uh, of how mental health or well-being is understood under the regimen of cognitive capitalism, what I want to do in the rest of this talk is uh, to delve into two alternative discourses about well-being uh, that have a historical importance and that are increasingly being deemed as naive or lacking of scientific rigor. These are psychoanalysis and its ethical commitment to self-reflection and ayahuasca and the reencounter with a millionaire spirituality. Sorry, I wanted to show, I didn't show this image, is uh, an artwork by Warren Niederch. It's called The Status Gone. And in some way, I choose this image to represent this first part of my talk because it talks about all the forces that in some way are shaping uh, the brain's neuroplasticity. As I told you, probably we will have time to discuss this image and its relation to each of the chapters of the talk uh, afterwards, during the Q&A or during the round table. So, psychoanalysis and its ethical commitment to self-reflection. Uh, this is an image of Valentina Desideri political therapy, uh, and it has been, uh, well, Valentina's practice has been really important for me to think about the relation of psychoanalysis to self-reflection and to feelings. Uh, I will start reading and, and and then explain it. So, unlikely the dominant trend in contemporary psychiatry, psychoanalysis that not understand, understand psychological distress or the symptom as something to be eliminated, but as a manifestation of an internal conflict that must be understood. According to Freud, the meaning of neurotic symptoms is derived from the patient's history. Recurrently, they are representations that due to their sexual nature are repressed and become in, inaccessible to conscious. That means that they can be formulated through language, which finally turns them into pathologica. Nevertheless, repression tends to fail, producing what we all know as the return of the repressed. The unconscious desire seeks to express itself and be recognized, but is only able to do it through a transa transaction or, ne or negotiation with the repressive forces making its, conscious, its way to conscious in a symbolic way. That symbolic representation of unconscious desire is what we know as a symptom. In defining the unconscious as the, as the object of a study of psychoanalysis, Freud, Freud generated a radical decentering of the individual with respect to the knowledge about itself, subverting the domina, dominant notion of the subject in the philosophy and psychology of consciousness of his own time. The Freudian subject is a subject of unconscious, of an unknown desire. It's therefore a precarious and contradictory and in process subjectivity, which constantly reconstitutes itself in a speech. In that line, the epistemology of psychoanalysis is based on listening and in conversation, of course. The patient, the patient speech leads to the relationships that constitute him or herself as the subject of an unconscious desire. The analyst listens with only two tools, his or her desire to heal and free floating attention. In the context of the psychoanalytical session, the patient transfer or re-edits way of relating or feeling that derived from the past into the figure of the psychoanalyst. The transference becomes the means through which the analyst access the unconscious of the patient. Slowly, and using his or her own counter-transference, the analyst gives feedback to the patient about aspects of his or her personality that this is unable to see. In general, psychoanalysis seeks the insight, that is, a moment in which the patient reaches an understanding of, of his or her inner conflicts in association with an emotional experience of certainty. 
This being true, it is important to recognize that today the developments of psychoanalysis theory and practice are so diversified that it's impossible to centralize them. In his book, Political Freud, historian Eli Zaretsky affirms that psychoanalysis work it simultaneously on three levels. As a theory of the mind, as a new paradigm, as a new paradigm for cultural interpretation, and finally, as an ethical commitment to self-reflexivity. During the 70s, psychoanalysis lost its privileged place in several of these areas. Thus, the theory of the mind resulted in neuroscience, its approach to culture found place in universities in the form of cultural and gender studies, although its ethical commitment to self-reflection has remained as a very distinctive future to psychoanalytical clinical practice. In this way, the objective of psychoanalysis in its clinical version, let's say, is not internalization of any specific value, rather than an, the analytical attitude in, attitude in itself. That means the ability to analyze our affects in conflict <laughs> without judging them. Therefore, the central idea of psychoanalysis is that a new moral responsibility may arise from the capacity to elaborate our unconscious experience, where the it was the ego shall rise Freud used to affirm. Analysis is endless and the conflict never disappears. The process of building knowledge about oneself is long and painful. In addition, there is no harmonious resolution of the conflict between the culture and the desiring subject. This comfort and pain are inherent to every form of cultural life. To work, love and smile is the definition of a good life for Freud. Well-being does lies in achieving a common unhappiness. Or to put it in another way, to find or finding our unconscious desire and identify with them and with our symptom to find a way to be in the world with others. So next part, uh, it's ayahuasca and the reencounter with a millenary spirituality. I'm showing here uh, this artwork, I think, uh, by Pablo Amaringo, who is uh, one of the uh, visionary, uh, most important visionary ayahuasca painters. Uh, so ayahuasca, and here I'm gonna repeat some things of the, of the last talk, is a Quechua word whose roots are aya, which means soul of of a dead person, and huasca, which means rope or vine. Therefore, it could be translated as rope of the souls or vine of the dead. Its use has spread throughout almost all the indigenous cultures living, cultures living in the Amazon basin of Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, and Brazil. In addition, in recent decades, its is, it has um, started its internalization thanks to both its medical and therapeutic use, and its adoption by a series of religious cults, mostly Brazilian, based, based in its ritual and regular use. Ayahuasca is a powerful psychotropic substance which results from the cooking of two Amazonian plants. Ayahuasca, which is a vine, and we saw some images of it before, and the leaves of a bush known as chacruna. From a strictly pharmacological point of view, chacruna, whose active ingredient is the DMT, is the awareness expanding element. However, chacruna or ayahuasca taken on their own don't have any kind of psych psychotropic effects. Some studies claim that DMT is a substance endogenous to our bodies, that is, that is naturally produced in the bodies of all human beings, and it plays a fundamental role in the visualization of dreams, mystical experience, and near-death experience. DMT is known as the one of, or probably the most powerful entheogen. And uh, just to explain, entheogen is a word to describe the properties of some medical plants that, for, uh, for example, ayahuasca, and avoid the connotations related to words like hallucinogen, or psychotropic, or, or psychedelic, sorry. Unfortunately, it's also one of the substances prohibited at an international level. For that reason, despite the fact that the use of plants with entheogenic, 
economic properties has a long tradition as a tool for the exploration of the human psyche, psyche. Almost all, all scientific and academic investigation around them has been suspended, suspended during the past 30 years. The first step towards understanding the legal status of ayahuasca in an international context is to make a categorical distinction between its use as an ancestral medicine and a laboratory produced DMT. Ayahuasca is not a drug but a medicine, and in the case of Peru, it has a tradition of more than 5,000 years. Not even the process of evangelization, enslavement of the indigenous population, and more recently, terrorism, has been able to raise its practice. Moreover, it, uh, very recently, it has been declared part of the country's national cultural heritage. One of the main characteristics of indigenous healing with ayahuasca is that it based, is based in an understanding of the universe that recognizes the multiplicity of spirit and forces that uh, actively intervene in our lives. The return to La Maloca, and Maloca is the ceremonial house for the Shipibos, which is the uh, cult, like the uh, people uh, from the Amazon that live specifically in Peru, uh, is the term of the indigenous organization of the Amazon Basin, known as COICA, because they are uh, part of this group, employed to explain the understanding of well-being. For them, to return to the Maloca means to recover our ancestral knowledge of harmonious and harmonious relationship with the environment. In this context, the ritual of ayahuasca plays a fundamental role for all these cultures, um, since it works as the get gateway to reestablish a sacred relationship with elemental for forces that, even we don't realize, traverses us. It is a healing process which reintegrates the patient into a larger reality that takes place with a holistic process in which the physical, the mental, the material, and the spiritual dimensions of life are fully acknowledged and honored. While the plant is the one that heals and teaches, the role of the ayahuasca healer or shaman is to provide the conditions in which this intimate and profound contact between the plant and the patient can take place. The tool of the shaman, the tool of, that the shaman uses, is known as the Icaros. Los Icaros, or the Icaros, sorry, are these cha chants. We show the patient the, paths, the path to go in and outside the ayahuasca trance. Apart from the Icaros, the shaman does not speak much. On the contrary, it's the physical process of purge of cat or catharsis what is the most important part. The ayahuasca cleansing is integral and enables the patient to purify the negative feeling stored both in the body and in the mind. In the ayahuasca experience, there are several, stage, several stages, very organic moments of pure sensibility and uh, moments of an extraordinary lucidity which heal and lead to self-knowledge. Raúl Muñoz, who is a um, uh, Peruvian shaman that I've been interviewing like in the last months, uh, and who is also a psychotherapist, you know, uh, he's based in Lima, and he normally gives uh, ayahuasca sessions to people that are not necessarily indigenous and have an indigenous tradition, but want to try the experience, says that compared to psychotherapy, uh, which is a long-term process, ayahuasca enables the patient to see everything in an, a single session. In, a, in addition, and also uh, in a different way to any kind of psychotherapy, uh, the word does not have, like words, conversation, does not have, don't have an important role. There is a natural understanding that remembering or putting into words is not important. Healing does not involve recalling what has been experienced, but lies in a state in the very experience itself. In Antipodates of the Mind, Benny Shannon argues that all the mental functions we, we with, that we associate with the human condition, including memory, imagination, and language, may have arisen from interaction with the entheogenic plants. Thus, 
Shannon suggests that the hallucinatory effects of these plants might have been decisive in the origin of many humanities, cultures, and religion. Moreover, many ayahuasca practitioners claim that ayahuasca is here between us to spread information from one species to another in order to mediate our relations with the environment, and that therefore the plant might become a catalytic influence in the awareness of the world environmental crisis. Um, so basically what you see what I've done is like uh, present two very or three very different understandings about the way in which we can understand what's well-being in our contemporary world. And paradoxically, they coexist, no? probably uh, in Peru, which is a post-colonial country, in which time is also like very heterogeneous, you know, you can find people living in, in the city, you know, integrated to like an international kind of cosmopolitan way of life, but at the same time you can find uh, non-contacted native groups, uh, you know, time is very, very different, like, uh, in those conditions. These, like, different uh, understandings of well-being just coexist as part of daily reality. Um, but, well, I want to present uh, some provisional conclusions because I am also aware that I've presented very three different uh, discourses of, paradigm, of paradigm, paradigms on well-being. So, in the course of this talk, I have presented three discourses which, while very dissimilar, coexist as models of how to understand well-being in the contemporary world. The three of them are available for us as possible ways, paths, etc. The hegemonic model is, without doubt, that the one of the ontology of the business of capitalism. From that perspective, well-being lies in the submission of the mind to the world that is basically adapting to the capitalist system and being as competitive as possible. In recent de decades, this ideology has been materialized in a new way of life that has violently imposed as the new status quo, school, sorry, which combines a very high productivity with a general, generalized precariousness. With this framework, psychotropification, which is the massive use of medication acts as a powerful program of social control backed by the pharmacological industry. While we should acknowledge that medication has relieved the suffering of many people, the problem when it's like expanded to the whole social body is that eliminates the capacity to experience the full range of human emotions and the freedom to regulate them independently in order in order to overcome or not to them. That is, it prevents us from acknowledging that pain is both a fundamental human experience and an inevitable component of any kind of mourning. As an alternative to this hegemonic discourse, I have presented two different ways of understanding well-being, that of the psychoanalysis and self-reflection and that of the ritual ingestion of ayahuasca and their encounter with a millinery spirituality. Currently, both discourses have been subordinated and deemed as naive or lacking of scientific rigor. However, they are not only reflective and critical practices in relation to what is presented to us as a status quo, but have converging long-term objectives. What I want to highlight here is that both of these practices admitting that they are very dissimilar, are based on care. Both psychoanalysis and the ritual of ayahuasca remind us that we are not autonomous beings, but depend on the gaze, the recognition, and the care of others to fully experience ourselves as subjects. They also evoke a connection between the subjectivity and the social realm by the private deprivatizing and despersonalizing toxic states of mind. Finally, they represent an intensification of a unique quest for a great self-knowledge and finding original answers to a series of questions uh, which traverse every human experience. What drives that search is not only the wish to stop the pain, you know, like just take a pill and not feel anything, but on the contrary, the excitement of self-discovery. 
whatever we, the, the path we choose, it's clear that well-being is not the original condition, but the result of a struggle, struggle against a symbolic violence which reduces us to components of a machine. As the Brazilian and psychoanalyst, uh, the Brazilian creator and psychoanalyst Sueli Rolnik states, uh, well-being has to do with the affirmation of life as a creative force, with its power of expansion, with, with depends, that depends on an aesthetic, aesthetic manner of apprehending the world. It is the opposite of a relation of submissive compliance marked by a disassociation of feelings and the deactivation of the dream state. Rather, it has to do with the experience of participating in the construction of meaning and existence, which gives meaning to the fact of living and lets us to feeling that life is worth living. Well, thank you very much. I don't know if, if you have any question. Hello. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question, actually. I'm just wondering, because in the first part, you're talking of um, epidemics of mental illnesses. Uh, that we've seen with ADHD and yeah, other mental illnesses, I guess. But I'm just wondering, because you're kind of creating a split between methods such as psychoanalysis and, and um, the use of medication, um, but do you really consider them as epidemics due to the use of medication that has increased, or just that maybe some people who were not diagnosed before can be diagnosed now with the knowledge we have. Um, yeah, that's kind of my question. What I consider, of course, mental diseases have always exist, but the problem uh, that I think uh, William Davis detects is that uh, cognitive capitalism is using our emotions, feelings, cognitive capacities, you know, work previously didn't involve, you know, these uh, emotions, feelings, desires. So in so far as this is happening as a condition of contemporary life, uh, mental illnesses have become an epidemic, you know, related to work, of course. You know, for example, if you read some statistics, uh, people are, uh, being absent to work because of uh, mental disorders more than any kind of physical pain or problem. So this is, I think, a characteristic or a future of contemporary life. And that's related to the overuse of medication because in so far, uh, mental illness becomes a problem for the economy, neoliberal policies, uh, politics starts to target them, you know, and the pharmaceutical industry in some way follows this idea, you know, and presents different alternatives to just stop mental illness by taking a pill, you know. And uh, of course, for example, in psychoanalysis, medication is very used, you know, it's not that psychoanalysis is not accompanied by medication when it's necessary, you know, but in, in a very different framework. You know, it's used only when it's necessary, uh, not just because uh, we have to stop the pain and be more productive, you know, which is, I, I think, the model that cognitive capitalism is proposing in some way. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for touching on uh, this side of mental illness in, uh, in society and I'm just about to start my therapy but I think it's really important to recognize that um, maybe even everybody has some sort of mental illness but it's really important to recognize that it's, um, 
it happens because of system we live in. So it's the scars that the system leaves on us. So if we just want to uh, run away from them and just mitigate or like just forget about them, first of all, it's it's not possible without addressing the system. And second of all, if we choose to ignore those scars, we are not going to be fighting. We're going to be just fine without it. So I think that's a really important part. And thank you. Thank you. You touched the other thing about political therapy, but you didn't really go into it in, into your talk. And I was wondering if you see that somehow as another alternative uh, yeah. pathway. Then I was also kind of just thinking about like Jodorowsky's psycho magic and this idea of like, Maybe there's a combination of kind of the, the surreal juxtapositions of ayahuasca and, and political therapy in, in some sense. Probably, uh, uh, well, political therapy is a. Oh. Political therapy is the practice of a really good friend of mine, an artist that also studied here at Pit Sort, Valentina de Sideri. And basically, what she's proposing is uh, to find an like its place with the setting of uh, psychotherapy. So you look for her with a problem uh, that is personal, but you recognize that has a political dimension. So basically, after that situation, she asks you to lay down and to embody the problem and she will use some kind of uh, hand imposition you know and after this hand imposition happened you well uh, sit again and you start to try to think about this problem with a new vocabulary and finally you create a diagram you know that allows you to understand how the political is related to uh, your personal problems, you know, but in a different way, you know. So it's just a process of, if you want to say, conscious awareness about how the personal is completely related to the social and political context in a, a still very ludical or, or playful way, you know. So it mixes. Um, a speculative and critical thinking. I don't know much about Jodorowsky's practice, so I, I couldn't tell from that. I was, I was wondering, Florencia, if you could uh, open up a little bit more this relationship between the scene of psychoanalysis and psychotropic drug taking practice experience, because it seemed, you know, mm -hmm. on the surface, they seem to be quite polarized, mm -hmm. perhaps even opposite. You know, one a very bourgeois institution mm -hmm. that costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time, one using <laughs> language, one, in a sense, coming into language through a different mechanism. But, but I get the feeling you want to think them together, yeah. but I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure exactly how that's going to work. Yeah, well, it's difficult to say. I have, of course, this intuition that both of them are based on basically human contact and care, you know. Uh, the experience of taking ayahuasca, as you were saying, uh, takes completely out or, or, or dissolves your ego. It's a very um, kind of challenging experience. And then you have the shaman, you know, who is helping you to go through this trance. And with its chance, Icaros, he's like supporting you, you know. Uh, and of course, after the session, you can or can't talk about it you know, but there's this kind of relation with father, you know, and of course with nature and this kind of cosmic visions that you have, you know. Uh, and of course psychoanalysis is very, this is product, uh, like I mean, uh, the ritual ingestion of ayahuasca comes from a pre-modern, you know, it's a very different culture. Uh, of course psychoanalysis is product of, you know, modernism, Still, it challenges modernism, but it's product of modern thinking, you know, and it's like in some way trying to domesticate, you know, the unconscious, 
you know, put words into the unconscious and then integrate it into the conscious personality so you can deal in a better way with your problems. So that is very different, you know, but the idea of like in some way being taken, taken care of, you know, it's what I think traverse both of experiences. Uh, still is a very important question and I think uh, yeah, I should think more about it to be honest. Hi there. Um, you were beginning to uh, talk about this idea um, in reference to both of these situations, um, ayahuasca and shamanism and psychoanalysis and, psycho and the psychotherapist. You mentioned, and I was wondering if you could go a little deeper into it, that you saw one as one of purging in the ayahuasca situation, you're purging, and in the uh, psychoanalytic period, I don't know if purging, you're not taking away, you're actually giving more, you're, or you're reconstructing, you're, you're rerouting. Yeah. You're rerouting stories, you're, you know, you're, you're making the, your life story more continuous, or mm -hmm. you, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And then I was also thinking about um, the Jim Carrey, uh, Jim Carrey movie, um, the movie about where they go into his memories and they extirpate them. Yes, they remove them mm -hmm. um, as a kind of the, the kind of something in the future, you know, that's, that we'll be able to do. And right now we have this thing called optogenetics, where in fact a mouse brain can be turned on and turned off memories, and a mouse brain can be turned off and turned on. Is there, what do you think? I mean, could you comment on that at all? Like how those three things might Work My together. impression, you know, is that uh, the, um, I mean, the understanding of, of mental health in cognitive capitalism is basically getting rid of the pain, you know, and just continue mm. to be productive and, you know, and if you are not in this kind of crazy rhythm, you just feel bad, you know, and then you are unable to see or to understand that this, if you're tired, exhausted, uh, depressed, is not just a personal problem, but it's also part of the system that is asking, you know, like too much, you know, from individuals. You know, we can't continue working with any kind of collective support, community, you know. So uh, I think that in some way, ayahuasca and psychoanalysis. Uh, in a very different way, you know, what they to do is try to de depersonalize these toxic states, you know, uh, until what point, you know, you can like, reach or, or, or manage this situation because, of course, as, as someone was saying uh, before, you know, there's no escape, there's no outside of cognitive capitalism right now in this moment, no? But at least you can have a critical position or a reflective practice that can give you some kind of distance or a safe place, you know, uh, in relation to all these uh, kind of uh, mandates that, that are seen as compulsory, as way of behaving that don't have escapatory when we have other possibilities, you know, to be in contact with ourselves and yeah, I think it's it's basically that. I'm talking here from well, the point of view of... It sounds like that, you know, in a way, um, it's a very neoliberal situation. It's about destroying the socius, the social network, mm -hmm. the safety net, and the process of individuation and the idea of the individual, and that these drugs are more... They're not dealing with, with repairing the social fabric, but are actually isolating the individual even more within their own of psycho... Course. Uh, of course, right. yes. And I know, for example, psychoanalysis has been like criticized a lot because of being like super elitist, taking a lot of time from you, taking a lot of money. But there are some like kind of therapies that are derived by from psychoanalysis that share the same principles. For example, uh, I mean, like the personal as political, you know, and the idea of analyzing feelings, 
maybe in, in like a group of peers, you know, like this kind of uh, sharing feelings, sharing preoccupations, you know, and, and, and having a space to talk and to reflect, you know, are increasingly being used, used in different societies, you know. So if you can't pay for uh, kind of traditional psychoanalytical therapy, therapy, which of course, as I already said, is super elitist, um, you have access now to different support groups that use the same principles. Um, do you mind if I just follow up? Um, thank you for your talk, Florencia. Um, and just to continue this notion of the production of symptoms and actually the production of pathology, mm -hmm. which is not only being produced by the fact that the pharmaco industry is hyper attentive to every deviation <laughs> from mm -hmm. a supposed norm of happiness and well being, but actually implementing performatively a kind of production of pain. Um, and it's not only at the level of the psyche, but also at the level of the soma, let's say, right? So in, in the US, there's an incredible advertising for Tylenol, in which is actually pain is, is represented as a good thing. Like, it's normal for you to have pain, it's okay, mm -hmm. but for every pain, there's a Tylenol. So we'll take care of your pain, right? But I was thinking in relationship to taking care, which is then psychoanalysis or mm -hmm. ayahuasca, um, Immediately, I was thinking about the, your work as a curator, as someone who supposedly takes care of artworks. And I was thinking about, if you could talk a little bit, about how is it that for you, as a curator, you can think about a kind of effective resistance and a taking care of that is not, let's say, pharmacopaternalistic, mm -hmm. um, but another kind of curatorial imagination or practice? Well, that's one of the, like, more difficult questions that someone has asked to me because I've been uh, for a long time trying to integrate my formation as a psychoanalyst. I, I also, in some moment, I used to have patients as well, no? So I, I uh, got to have a clinical, clinical practice uh, and my work as a curator. And of course, I find many similarities in the way in which you, for example, deal with the artist, do a studio visit, uh, in an infrastruct infrastructural level, it, I think is much more complex because the art world ideally is a space where you can, uh, where like a lot of discourses around, um, I don't know, left politics uh, happen and circulate, but it really has a very clear administrative uh, barriers, you no. Know? So, of course, I have like uh, ethic develop as a curator, and of course, it's informed by my practice as a psychoanalyst in some point in my life, you know. But of course, it's also related to this uh, reality or to these circumstances, no. And for example, in Lima, in Peru, it's very it's very different from here because I, I work uh, in an independent art space. Uh, which is supported by the Initiative for Art Foundation. Uh, but on the other side, I also work in a space of a collector, you know, of a Latin American collector. So, you know, decisions do not necessarily respond to what is um, uh, good for the public, but probably to some specific interests. So, you know, it's complicated to to answer. Uh, first, it was for me a very beautiful talk, but when I was when you said about ayahuasca experience and the unnecessity or of language and also the difficulty to be translated in the language, I think that's a very critical part and maybe it could be seen as a psychedelic experience, particularly ayahuasca, if it's as a deconstruction for the ego and oneself. 
the political therapy and psychotherapy, like a group psychotherapy can be the reconstruction of one's own role, maybe, because then language is something communicative and in the ayahuasca experience, diving into oneself, you do not need to use these words that we use today, which language in itself is also built in almost a way in which you cannot pronounce some sort of things. Therefore, maybe the political therapy could be a very efficient, maybe, or what do you think about it, way of rebuilding a language in which these can be discussed or communicated between people. For I experience sometimes after a psychedelic experience, in the real world of set values, it's very difficult to respond to something because it doesn't make sense to you. Yes, I agree. For example, in the case of psychoanalysis, we have, uh, or there are like two different uh, ways of describing dreams. And I'm gonna tell it in Spanish because I'm not sure about the exact translation in English. So we have contenido manifiesto and contenido latente, which will be something like manifest content and latent content. So um, uh, contenido manifiesto is when you turn your dream in a narrative. But have you seen that every time you turn a dream into a narrative with language, it loses a lot of sense? You know, because language is organized, uh, past and future is logic. You Subject know? and object. Yeah, and in the case of dreams, for example, that could be near a psychedelic experience in some ways. You, you have the no contradiction principle, you know, things can be and cannot be. Um, there's no time. There's other two mechanisms that are uh, known as condes condensation which is, for example, one person can be three other persons at the me, uh, three other people at the same time, and desplazamiento, displacement, which means that uh, some things, like an issue, can be displaced in, in a completely different situation, or a person can be a completely different person or situation. So this kind of not logic experience uh, when you translate it to languages, to language, loses a lot. And that's why I think it doesn't necessarily make sense uh, in a psychedelic ayahuasca or, or even like dream experience to, to translate it to language, you know, because you lose a lot. Of course, it's important because it's the way that we also have to communicate or to understand ourselves. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something that you can't avoid, no? Yeah. But when I've heard close friends talking about their ayahuasca, ayahuasca experience, it's like, it's super difficult to explain, no? Yeah. It's and almost, uh, yeah. I think this lost in translation part of it constitutes the core of it. And the, when sometimes in translation it becomes so nice, sounds very naive and uh, far. And I think this is how the cognitive capitalist hegemony can easily discard these things as just untrue. Mm -hmm. And maybe the political therapy or psychoanalysis can be a tool for communicating, rebuilding, reconstructing these experiences into communicable or a common understanding, like a new language almost using the terms we have today for language. And in this way, maybe it could come back to relevance in political discourse. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think uh, well, Valentin is also uh, trying to do that specifically, no? Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think that could be an alternative, of course. And I don't know, for, for example, now ayahuasca, this is something very new for Peru, because uh, in Peru you never have had the necessity to plant ayahuasca. So basically, if you want to consume ayahuasca, you get in contact to a sh with a shaman, and the shaman will go to the Amazon and just take it, you know, it was like a free resource. Uh, and now I, that I was talking with this uh, shaman, Rawa Muñoz, he told me 
it has disappeared. There's no ayahuasca, you know, in the places that we used to find it. So probably we will have to like intern ourselves like deeper in the Amazon to find it, you know, and well, in some point, because also of like this kind of spiritual tourism from like the West towards uh, like the Amazon, uh, I don't know what, what would it mean if in some point uh, an ayahuasca needs to be planted, you know, as any other drug. What, that in, what does it mean? What does it lose, l loses in that process, you know? So there are a lot of ethical questions that the use of ayahuasca uh, is like uh, facing in, in current times, no? Yeah, I just have a question um, about uh, psycho psychotropic medication. Um, don't you think there is a misuse of medication? As in, I feel that it's often used to cure something, uh, but considering mental illnesses, I don't think it's meant to cure, I think it's meant to help. Um, and I feel like, for instance, that there's a big difference in taking Xanax, for example, because you have an exam and you're too stressed, so you want to be less stressed, which is, to me, a bit ridiculous. Uh, and taking Xanax because, because you actually have a panic attack that's dis disabilitating you. Um, and I feel that today it's become globalized, the use of medication, because it's used to cure, but it has never been made to cure, I feel. So I was wondering what you think about this. Yes, uh, I think obviously it's, it's not made to cure, it's, it's uh, thought to make life easier or more like uh, control level for people that uh, really suffer for, for, from serious mental diseases. Um, uh, still the problem, I think that uh, like the pharmaceutical industries presents their researches on psychotropic as very sophisticated, you know, as they are know the exact pill that will cause, you know, the effect that you're looking for in the patient, when in reality it's very rudimental, you know, and you can see every time that you, a psychiatry, a psychiatrist starts to medicate a patient, you know, it gives him or her like this pill, and then uh, in a lot of occasions, people lose taste, you know, they feel super weird, so they have, try, they have to try with another medication. So it's not sophisticated at all, you know. It's a very rudimentary technology still, you know. And I think there's like a lack of conscience of this, and people take medication as if they were taking, you know, something like, like candies, you know? And that's what is known as the psychotropification of society, you know? Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have one more question. Yes. Oh. Thank you so much. <laughs>